afternoon, folks, or uh, good morning uh, if you are on the, the West Coast. Uh, super glad to have you here for today for uh, our discussion on how we're going to plan for spring break uh, during the middle of a pandemic. Uh, so want to start off with uh, making sure that you understand that this is a, a discussion, uh, not only amongst the folks that, that may be sitting on the panel, but also with you. Um, and we really want you to participate in that discussion. Uh, so in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, uh, you'll probably see maybe uh, something that says Q&A. And what I'd like to encourage you to do is just to go ahead and uh, uh, click on that, which should expand it, and then gives you an opportunity to type in questions um, and submit those in, and then we'll bring them up with the panelists um, at, at the appropriate time. Uh, if some questions are, are real easy to answer, we might just uh, respond back in there uh, for you to see. If this is your first discussion um, with us, uh, the, this session is going to last about 60 minutes. Um, and it really is just a community discussion and presentation of uh, best practices. Uh, so there's going to be question and answers from the community. We want to invite you to participate. Um, and it's going to be great discussion with the, 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 uh, uh, the distinguished uh, colleagues that we've got on the panel. Uh, if there are any members of the press that are visiting, we'd love for you to just drop a note into the Q&A. Uh, just let us know who you are and where you're from. If there's anything that you'd like to use from today's session, uh, just reach out to us and we'll make sure that we connect you with the right uh, individual uh, to help with that. Uh, Webinar Wednesdays are, you know, a biweekly gathering of attraction industry experts uh, where we discuss the current challenges and um, how we can position our attractions for success. Uh, so this is really all about kind of helping each other out in the industry uh, and making sure that our industry uh, continues to thrive um, on that. So we're super glad that you've joined us today where we're going to be focusing on preparing for spring break. And Randy, I know we've got a, a, a lot of other good sessions coming up. Uh, you want to share a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, everybody. I'm happy to be here from Chile, Nashville, where I'm drinking my third cup of coffee, and it's snowing outside. Um, but we're, we're excited, and my kids are loving life because it's day three of now a five-day um, we're not in school. <laughs> so that's good for them. Um, yeah, we have some great sessions coming up. We do webinar Wednesdays every other week, so join us in two weeks where we learn from other industries. We have some some great uh, speakers that are going to be joining us to share what is it like in that other industry and, and what we can learn from that. And then we have a very special webinar planned for March 10th, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. And then on St. Patrick's Day, the pot of gold at the end of this journey, we're going to look for some of the silver linings uh, throughout this this COVID uh, 2020, moving to 2021, what's changed? What are we sticking with? What is going to help us as we move forward? And then what is the future of membership pass programs? I'm really excited to hear um, about the changes that are put on with many attractions and their pass and membership programs. But um, most excited about, I want to, I want to talk and pause for just a moment and share about um, International Women's Day, uh, which is on Monday, March 8th. This webinar is to celebrate uh, during that week. So we are hosting a very special um, women, um, women's leadership webinar series that is going to happen on that day. Uh, I am absolutely invite you to join us. I'm going to send a link into the chat for everybody. Um, it's going to be a great program. Um, I highly recommend you register. We at Gateway Ticketing are partnering with Whitewater Industries to co-sponsor this event, and we're um, having all of our employees attend from both companies. So we, we absolutely would love to have you join us for this special webinar on March 10th. Um, so you can learn more about it on that link, and we'll send you guys more information um, afterwards. So um, my colleague, Matthew Hohenstein, is one of our co-hosts. I think this is our 25th or 26th webinar. I keep getting my numbers wrong, Matthew. I'm, I'm going to guess. I think that's about right. Um, we're always happy to be here as we share some uh, insights in the industry. This is me, my contact information there. I'm our wildlife and conservation principal here at Gateway Ticketing. Joining us today, um, we've, we've got some folks that are joining us again that have been um, some great panelists. John Ralph, the Vice President of Operations at Aquarium of the Pacific, is joining us. He's actually stepped away for a little bit. We're hoping to have him join us. Um, sometime before the end of the webinar. And we also have Nicole Meek, who's the Senior Manager of Guest Services um, at the Aquarium of the Pacific. So hi, Nicole. We're happy to have you here. Um, we also have a really great friend of mine, somebody I've known a long time, Ken Handler. 
um, from amusement professionals, global management amusement professionals. Ken started uh, in the water park industry, uh, Raging Water, San Jose. We go way back as water park guys. Um, Ken is, is uh, helping attractions all over the place, water parks, FECs get up and running. Um, extremely knowledgeable in the F&D space. Um, so you can find him on amusementprofessionals.com. Um, we're going to chat with Ken about how some ideas to help people as they get going. Hi, Ken. Good to have you. Um, behind the scenes, Bill D'Angelo, any tech problems you might have, Bill will help you out. You know, he'll answer those chat questions and the Q&A. Um, so we'd like to get started. Uh, if this is your first webinar Wednesday, we always start with a bit of an industry update. I'm going to pass it off to Matthew, who's got some really exciting updates. Yeah, so uh, one of the things that that we saw uh, come out of Hong Kong just, uh, I think, this morning, uh, maybe uh, late last night, was Hong Kong Disneyland reopening. Um, so while this is, you know, something that, that we've come to expect, they unfortunately, um, this will be their third reopening. But the one big takeaway, um, this was the first time that I had noticed this from any of the attractions, is that they are actually going to be implementing uh, COVID-19 PCR tests for all cast members um, so that they are, are ensuring that the environment that, that guests will be entering um, is as pristine as possible. Um, I think that, you know, one of the reasons that, that probably that decision was made is that, that Hong Kong has really been struggling and had very tight um, requirements when it comes to uh, COVID-19 um, and has been very restrictive in, in the businesses that have been able to operate. And I think this is one way to kind of say, hey, we understand that, that it, this is a big deal and, and we're going to take even extra steps to kind of make sure that we're helping and contributing to a, a positive environment. As we start thinking about um, spring break, uh, one of the things that I, I ran across from the New England Aquarium is, is a situation where they're dealing with a lot of demand um, and then obviously a limited capacity. Um, so the Boston Public Schools has a uh, kind of a, a winter break or, uh, you know, here in February. Um, and so one of the things they, they've run into is that they've been selling out, um, uh, you know, days in advance. Um, so right now they're currently sold out until uh, February 20th. Um, and, and Sunday is the first day that you could actually book a ticket. Um, and, and obviously that's because, one, you've got a bunch of demand. You have a lot of kids that are out of school. Uh, number two, they're operating, obviously, at a, at a reduced capacity. Now, they've chosen to operate at a 20% capacity, where the regulations in the area that they are, are is a 40% capacity. Um, one of the other things I, I picked up from, from an interview that their CEO did is that they had made that decision um, because they are a science-based um, uh, uh, attraction and that they wanted to air on that side of, of having a, 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 a uh, even s smaller uh, capacity limit uh, to ensure the safety uh, of guests and team members. We then move into um, speeding up uh, vaccination. And we've seen a lot of attractions um, really saying, hey, I've got a lot of space. Um, people being vaccinated is obviously one of the keys to my future success. And then, um, you know, allowing that space to be used. So um, up in Canada, we've got Canada's Wonderland that's uh, looking to host a mass vaccination site come springtime. Um, and then, you know, back in January, uh, Disneyland Resort in Anaheim had um, uh, loaned out one of their parking lots, the, story, the Toy Story parking lot, for a, a vaccination site. So, um, I think as, as we are looking at some of our assets that might be underutilized um, in situations where we can allow them to be used for something that will benefit us, um, as well as to, to help get um, our attractions out there in, in, in the, uh, and discussed uh, in the news, uh, certainly can't hurt. Um, yeah, uh, Matthew, my parents yeah. got their first round at uh, at Disney as well, and my mom said it was amazing. She said that the the efficiency of operation was fantastic. They showed up, I helped her with the QR code, but um, honestly, she was so happy to just be back at Disney. That was one of the things that she had said was she went there, they did the vaccination, and I believe when they went, there was some outdoor shopping that was reopened, and so she went and um, bought some 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 Disney merch, so it was a good experience for them. 
No, that's great. Yeah, I think we've heard a little bit of other news reports about how um, experts in, in dealing with people have been able to help vaccination sites in, in their efficiency. I know uh, some Chick-fil-A um, operators had helped to say, hey, when you're doing a drive through here's some ways to make it really efficient. Um, so it's really great that, that we're all able to come together um, and contribute our times, our talent, um, and some of our assets in, in kind of getting us past this. So super exciting. Obviously, at the, the forefront of, of all of our attractions is, is making sure that we're bringing in revenue. I, I, I highlighted a couple um, things that I had run across um, of, of innovative ways um, that folks were doing that. One was the Toronto Zoo, uh, which was really focusing on, hey, one of the, the, the big costs of the zoo is obviously um, feeding the animals. And in situations where the attraction is closed and, and uh, many of the revenue streams are shut off, uh, they really took a very personal message out, you know, very transparent, very clear on kind of, hey, um, you know, what does this mean for us? Um, and then, you know, had a call to action of, of allowing folks to uh, contribute. The, uh, you know, some smaller attractions that, that maybe aren't able to be open because of, of the, the regulations are, are finding niche ways that they can still offer a, ser a service. Um, so the, uh, uh, um, Sorry, Little Rays uh, here in the in the center is leveraging their private tours and some VIP sloth encounters that that are very small, one family unit um, that they are able to offer. Um, and I think they certainly have the opportunity to to have a little bit of a premium price for that as well. You know, in, in these situations where we're bringing really exclusive content or exclusive experiences, I think that that certainly speaks to having a little bit higher of a price point also um, to help meet meet the objectives of the um, organization. And the last one was over in Germany, and it was the Rostock Zoo, um, where they were uh, leveraging some digital assets and, and ultimately spinning up a digital escape room um, to help give folks um, an ability to, you know, help support the zoo, as well as to bring some of their life of the, the animals to, uh, uh, to folks. Um, so some, some interesting ideas out there if, if we're continuing to think through um, that. And the last thing I had come across I wanted to share with the group was, um, you know, ensuring that, that we understand that we can adapt and we can do things differently from a myriad of different ways. And, and here I thought this was a great one that Six Flags America um, had really identified that, hey, we're going to operate a little bit differently in the way that we recruit, um, hire and train folks um, and really kind of, you know, uh, maximizing the use of, of, of doing all of that virtually. Um, so it was interesting. It's not only just the interviews, which, you know, I think some of us have, have, have probably uh, at our attraction started to do, um, but also the training, the formal onboarding process, all of that being done virtually um, so that, you know, we, we are probably finding some efficiency in, in, able to, in ability to execute that, but then um, minimizing any of those congestive situations that we might have in a classroom. Um, that way, then when they get on site with their on site, uh, on the job training, uh, they're ready to really step in and, and, and go. Awesome. Thank you so much, Matthew. We actually had a question come in, and, and I want to let everybody know um, Isaac, great, great question. Uh, in the future, will attractions ask for proof of vaccination? And I don't have a slide about this, but I, I have certainly been reading articles about that, and some regions are are looking at this idea of, of a vaccination passport. We already know that um, traveling to Hawaii, um, that there are elements where you you don't have to, with a proof of vaccination, I think you can waive your your 10-day quarantine. Uh, there's some other places like that. Matthew, do you have have you come across any articles about attractions? possibly waiving or doing something requiring vaccinations? Yeah, I, I've certainly seen that attractions are starting to try to get an understanding of what vaccination means for folks feeling um, like they can go out, whether or not they're going to feel safe at attractions and things like that. Um, so I think that it's, it's going to be certainly helpful for us in understanding how quickly consumers are going to be responding. In the United States, um, I, I don't believe that we will be see situations where it's required um, 
until we got to a point potentially where we had a majority of the population vaccinated. Um, obviously, there's a lot of you know, potential privacy concerns. There's overreaching um, concerns that, that some folks are going to have that I think are going to hinder that. Um, but I, I do think that we might get to a situation where we have a majority of the population that's vaccinated. And the one way that I think some attractions are going to be able to increase their capacities is by kind of proving that they're a, a safe space, right? So if they're, if they are requiring vaccinations in order to go in there, then that would certainly speak to that, that, uh, capacity could probably be higher. Um, I think that the question's probably just uh, out a little bit on if we think that in the near future folks are going to re require it. Um, but I think that we may see steps towards it. But I think certainly in the United States that we're probably going to have a pretty high wall to climb, uh, before we would see any of anything being required just because, uh, of the, the political nature, the sensitivity from a, a personal decision-making standpoint and a freedom um, that, that is, is probably going to control what our abilities are there. Ah, that's a great segue about reopening safely and, and putting your best foot forward. And <laughs> that's my next slide. Um, I noticed this um, new website that was launched recently by CAPA, the California Attractions uh, Association for Parks um, in California. Well, I'm butchering the name. I apologize. But there it is right there, and, it, and it's a really great website that they put together to advocate for reopening, and I'm actually just going to pull the website over here so you all can see it. But um, this is a coalition of attractions in California saying we are ready to open. A lot of my great friends have been posting about this on LinkedIn and other social channels, um, and this website is a, is a great testament to working together for that one common goal to, to say, yes, we're ready. We have a reopening plan. We are working together, united, and please let us reopen uh, because there's so many jobs at stake and, and obviously revenues. Um, and they've gone so far as to um, build this little tool that you click on it, tell the governor you're ready. It tells you exactly how to contact the governor, what to do um, to, to kind of pace whether you're on a PC or a Mac and, you know, put in your, um, your, your little letter here. So, Really cool resource. I, I was pretty happy to see that being put together so that these places can open safely and enjoy, um, let the guests enjoy the experiences. Um, so I've got a little case study. I asked my friends about spring break and immediately our friends at Detroit Zoo came to mind because they have a very popular event that it's called Bunnyville. And Bunnyville heralds in the new season. Obviously, it's cold and it's snowing there right now, but typically right around Easter, they have Bunnyville, and it's an event where they, they bring ten to 12,000 visitors uh, a day for Bunnyville, and it's typically the weekend uh, prior to Easter. And there's hunts, and there's a lot of activities and a lot of things coming together. And, of course, in 2020, they had to cancel it. So I was talking to my friend Randy uh, Hamilton over there and said, hey, what are you doing differently? What, what's happening? Are you going to cancel it? And she said, well, no, we just had to reimagine it. And we really looked in the past to see how we could do this differently in, in the in the future. And as a case study, she said, we, we looked at what we did differently at Wildlife. Now, their Wildlife event was hugely successful. Uh, they were expecting around 50,000 people to attend Wildlife. That's obviously down uh, because of the capacity restrictions at the Detroit Zoo based on their local governance. They could not bring in the types of the amount of people that they normally would want to bring in, but they exceeded their expectations. They had uh, over 86,000 people attend. And not only did they instead do it over the 20, I think 29 nights that they typically would run it, they extended it in mid-December. They extended it to be later into January just because there was so much demand. So they thought, wow, we just did this. Reservations were required. It was a great experience. They surveyed extremely well. How can we incorporate this new way of thinking into the next program? And the next program being Bunnyville, which is, is slated to be in April. So they reimagine it. And I, I'm just sharing you, like, literally their, their internal notes about this event. They were gracious enough to share kind of the conversations that they've been having. Um, I like how they position this with a goal in mind, and they extended the times. It's an event where it's, it is a free event, um, so you could just come and participate, but they really wanted it to be just like I said, to herald in the new season and to let people know it's business as usual at the Detroit Zoo, meaning come and enjoy, but there's these new rules around it. 
So they've extended it. You can see some of the time. They've got some great member hour only times. The daily capacity uh, limits are going to, you know, be in place. So they're not going to see this huge number they were seeing before with 10 and 12,000 people, but they're going to still see some good numbers. And then they've thought about a variety of events that they can put in place. So some of these are fun little virtual. I love the idea of, of having a virtual egg hunt going around and looking for animals at the zoo that, you know, have eggs versus, you know, live birth. And they're able to use these QR codes and giveaways um, and a lot of great things. And notice there also the double discounting on retail. They want people to enjoy and stay. They want to push people into the retail centers so that they can um, really participate and, and, and show they care with their wallet, so to speak. But anyway, I thought it was a good uh, starting point to kind of say, this is, this is what's happening. And this is a way to think about your different programs um, that are typically around spring break and, and to talk about what you're, what you all are going to be doing. Um, spring break is an exciting time for all of us. Um, we, in the attraction industry, I mean, me and a water park guy and Ken will jump in this into a bit, but, you know, spring break is a very important time period. It's when a lot of us train and hire. For other locations, it's when we start to see membership sales go up. It's when we see Canadian travelers come down into Southern California, typically. Um, Texas would normally be getting ramped up right around now, understanding it's a different time right now with the snow and the blizzards. But this is a time period where we start to see a lot of activity. So I want to switch gears. Nicole, I want to chat with you about spring break in, in, in California, in Long Beach. It's, it's a time when the sun's out, it's warm, it's toasty. What does a typical spring break look like for you? You've been at the aquarium for 18 years. What is normally happening right now in February as the aquarium is getting ready? Uh, hi, everyone. Hi, Randy. Thanks for having me. Um, I, I would say a, a typical spring break, we normally think of spring break as a, you know, as a two-week period that sort of sandwiches Easter. And for us, it's really six to eight weeks long uh, because schools, you know, it, that's when they're, they're off. It's not necessarily based around Easter anymore. So it's a really long, uh, it can be a really long period of time. Um, so this time of year, we would normally be um, in full hiring mode. We normally would start that at the end of January to be ready for spring break and then continue that into the summer. Spring break's really a, a springboard to summer. Um, and then normally we would have the Grand Prix happening uh, the Grand Prix of Long Beach, but uh, this year they have moved the Grand Prix uh, from a April to September. They want their guests to get the full uh, experience, so we will not be uh, tackling spring break and the Grand Prix at the same time, which actually for us is a blessing. It will help. Um, it will help us tremendously. Uh, I'm actually glad you brought that up. We were chatting about this right before the meeting, sir. We were talking about this. So normally, you know, this kind of, these crowds, these people in the the grandstand, normally that's a good thing for any business. You'd be thinking, that's great. Everyone's going to want to go. But um, in many years, I think you can't even open, right? Is that sometimes? We, you, we were closed for many years, and then uh, we, we took the step of trying to open three, four years ago. It's really a parking. Our parking structure is trapped inside the track. Uh, the aquariums outside the track. So it's really about access and mm -hmm. guests can't, can't access us uh, like they normally would. And then they're intermingling with people who are coming to the race. Uh, so we really have uh, challenges trying to sort our guests from the Grand Prix guests because they are not the same group. People who are coming to the race are here for the race. They're not here you know, to come to the, the nearby aquarium. So for us, it's it's helpful. <laughs> it's helpful to not have it during the spring break period. Thank heaven. Um, thank <laughs> you heaven. Know, yeah. <laughs> that, that's awesome. I mean, I, and there's obviously silver linings in all of this, sure. right? Where things yeah. get changed. And you mentioned hiring, and I want to give us an opportunity to introduce Kenny for a moment uh, as well. And then we'll just have a free for all because there's a lot of questions that I have. And, and I highly encourage everybody to a ask your questions um, in the chat. But Kenny, yeah. Um, water park guy, you and me, we both know that this is a time when we're hiring. Nicole mentioned it as well. I mean, what advice do you do you have for people that use this time to hire? What should they be doing differently now? 
It's, it's, it's a great question. What I would say is typically your pattern wouldn't change. It's just what are you using to help you accomplish your goal? How are you taking advantage of technology technically? This is a great example of what you can accomplish with just doing interviews. Um, a lot of times you can't bring people in, but with the, the different technologies, just use those assets that you have to accomplish your goals. I'm seeing more and more parts when we get into startups as they start doing their planning and processing the questions, okay, how are we going to start interviewing and bringing these people in? Social media is still uh, a popular route. Zoom meetings and those kind of aspects are really getting you started. A lot of things are getting done through technology now. It's, I think we're now just realizing how successful technology is helping us out. I, I, Matthew, I don't know if you're going to jump in. I want to jump in really quick about a, a question about hiring and Nicole and Kenny. Um, I, I'm thinking back of the days when everybody wanted to work at the water park that I was working at. So I worked at a water park in, called Wild Rivers and we would see thousands of, of kids over just a few weekends wanting a job. And I, I'm thinking about how amazing Zoom would be. Uh, of course, you want to meet with people individually, but is anybody doing like mass Zoom meetings for hiring? Uh, my kids actually did this. They auditioned for a, a theater program at their school on Zoom, but it wasn't one on one. Like there, it was a <laughs> it was a group audition. I mean, is that something? And we used to do group interviews as well. So Nicole or Kenny, are you seeing people do that so they can take the mass amount of people that want a job and maybe having six or eight people show up to one Zoom meeting to interview them? I, I guess I should just say that we actually have not started the hiring process yet. We have held off on that. Uh, we don't anticipate opening at least, uh, you know, for maybe three or four more weeks here in California. We really don't know. So uh, at this point, we aren't doing any hiring at this time. Yeah. What in Cross our fingers, Nicole, because I'm in San Diego, yeah. so uh, <laughs> yeah. we've had some good news coming out of the government at the moment of changing tiers and numbers, so hopefully we'll see some good numbers. But what, what I would say is even with last year, Randy, uh, with the parks that we helped start up and get open for the park is that uh, you can schedule and relate to scheduling and like uh, scheduling programs to put people into programs. We really didn't do a group interview program. Uh, what we did do is minimize the time that we spent with each candidate. Uh, spend, I, Randy, I can remember the days where we had thousands of people lined up out of our doors coming in, filling out the paper applications, bringing them in. You, you brought in your leadership team. You hope that you can get through so many people for so many times and turn them over and say, you know, unofficially give them a score and say, okay, this person showed up looking professional. This person showed up not looking professional. Or, you know, you had to go through the quick Symposiums and those some of those changes don't change because when you do the Zoom meeting, as you can see, when we do the Zoom meeting, did they show up on the Zoom meeting looking professional or did they look like they just woke up and they have their pajamas on? You know, it's those kind of things that are helping us uh, work through the process. And actually, technically, it shows that they even have technical skills to get on Zoom or uh, email their resumes now that we have computer skills. So there's a lot of advantage now using this avenue. Um, but I have not done the group interviews, not saying you can't. Uh, usually for those, which I, I, I will test that this year, Randy, because I think it's important for like birthday party hosts and hostesses, they've got to be able to speak up related to things. They've got to be able to sing and they can't be shy. And, um, and this is a great opportunity to see them. But um, we're, we're scheduling people through Zoom and a scheduling program, just giving them about five, 10 minutes in an interview to kind of get it started. That's great. Hey. Nicola, one of the things I wanted to ask you, uh, you, you mentioned that you, you haven't really started hiring, and, and there's a potential that you don't really have a need to hire, depending on what your operation may look like and the staff that you've already got on. Um, but as you're thinking of maybe what you need as a par level of staffing, have, are you thinking about that now differently than you have in the past? Like, is it a higher number of, of folks that you want to have on the bench because you're you're thinking that you're going to have more call outs or anything like that? Or are you evaluating that differently as you go into the spring break? Um, it's certainly a factor. It's a great question um, because you have to take the temperature of 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 people's your levels, risk levels, and and what uh, you know how how many days a week are people willing to be amongst 
crowds <laughs> just from a staffing uh, you know standpoint. So um, that it, it's certainly a factor and certainly a new factor, right? We've never had to uh, consider that uh, you know before, um, but. Uh, I think we would really default back to what does the operation need to operate safely? And if we're only going to be operating at, you know, 40, 50 percent, you know, what, what does that look like in all of our spaces to make the decision about how many people we would need to bring on? I think ultimately that's, that's the fact that you have to fall back on. Yeah, and it's also, um, it, it, on top of that, thinking about the type of person that you are going to hire for these positions. And I think, Tim, you kind of had said it pretty well, where you're like, what, what is their technical acumen? What, what, what other mm -hmm. elements do they have? Because if I was hiring for any positions going forward, knowing that you're, you know, what contact traits away from losing, I don't know, a handful of employees, I'm thinking of my kids at school and, you know, if, if one of them sits next to somebody, you know, we've lost this group of people, you you probably are trying to hire someone that's really um, able to fill a variety of roles. So they, they might need to be lifeguards and get services and retail or, or whatever that might be. You're really going to probably need to train these folks to do lots of roles to be an ideal employee uh, to fill in any gaps with Kenny. So that's probably a big change as well in terms of hiring, especially seasonal employees um, for, for a seasonal operation. Absolutely. I think that we're looking at how to use your allies and assets that you have available. Technology uh, that's out there now um, for HR services is a great example. Uh, there's a bunch of companies that are our solve all that do payroll, they do benefits, they do uh, scheduling, they do the hiring process for you. And I'll, I'll give you an example. I'm not favoring one over the other, but uh, Zamp HR is a great program um, that they help you through the process and stages and make sure and they handle all even the, your employee benefits programs, your insurance needs. So those kind of programs are now solve all so that ultimately I re as much as I love having an HR person on the staff, I don't have to. So it's a little bit of a cost savings, but there's a trade. And where that trade is is potentially the payroll pieces and those kind of coordinations. But when, when you look at uh, kind of what Nicole talked about, there's a lot that we have to do to plan appropriately to get up and running. Um, you know, unfortunately, not to go off on tangent, I hope this is okay, is um, you're dealing with uh, what did we learn from COVID? How do we benefit from COVID? As bad as COVID was, and it, and, it, and it was something that hit us hard, is how do we learn to adjust? And now we're facing, in California, where we're at pretty close to $15 an hour minimum wage. That's coming. So how do we, we have to look in our crystal ball and how do we adjust? And a lot of it is, you know, as the technology pieces, um, you know, QR coding, buying things on in advance, you know, advanced purchases. The community and our demographics has learned now they have to purchase things online. How do they use their phone to buy it? I mean, it's self-training that, for example, Grubhub, you can order on your phone and the food arrives. It's no difference when you come into our parks now. How are we using that to take advantage of us and how do we help reduce a little bit our staffing needs? Yeah, no, I, I think that's a great point, Ken. That, that's one of the things I've heard a lot of discussions of late is how do we maximize self-serve? How do we, we take some of this you know, it, 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 there, there's a multitude of benefits, right? It's, it's, you know, removing friction from the experience. It's potentially removing costs from the experience. It's, it's doing many things, and, and, and this has maybe been a, a little bit of a springboard to help us to embrace that. Kind of in, in that vein of things, I would love to understand what you all think needs to be or, or, or is different from a retail and a food and beverage standpoint as you're going into the spring break. Um, so, Nicole, maybe can you share how, how you may be managing those revenue centers a little bit differently this spring break um, uh, uh, as you go into it? Uh, yes, it's a great question. Our retail uh, services are, are booming. <laughs> Surprisingly enough, um, we've, we're able to or open our indoor store as well as our outdoor store because our indoor store has an exterior opening, right? You don't get it. You don't get to it from inside the aquarium. It has an outside um, entrance. So people, uh, 
uh, are willing to spend. Um, and we, we've been able to, uh, to see some good revenue come in there. Our food uh, space is a little limited um, with our outdoor spaces being uh, only accessible. So food isn't doing as well, uh, but uh, retail is, is really doing well. The, the challenge with us is, a, is places for people to sit and eat. Right? How do you how do you provide that and do that in a safe way, um, be it benches or tables, and keep you know distance? So we've really got you know limited uh, menus, limited uh, food, you know food service offerings. So as you would expect, uh, the, the revenue is not um, as strong as as the retail. Um, so. I, I, it's great to hear that folks are wanting to shop. I, I think one of the, the the business problems or opportunities that a lot of attractions may be dealing with right now also is is I've got to build up of inventory because I, you know, ordered as if we were going to be open last week and last month and and, and have you know 100% of folks here, not 20%. Um, so one of the, th the the tools I've been seeing some folks doing is is coming up with kind of some packaging of, of multiple products together to kind of help understand, hey, I need to, to drill, drive down this, this inventory, um, but I do have folks that are willing to pay. So how do I kind of reassemble some items together to kind of achieve both goals, right? How can I maximize revenue and kind of help reduce my inventory so I'm not carrying uh, th this high um, item on my balance sheet? Uh, Ken, from a, a, a food and beverage or a retail standpoint, are there any things that you are, are thinking of, of, hey, we, we probably need to do this a little bit differently this year versus – um, in prior seasons? Well, first, Nicole nailed it. So I give total kudos to Nicole on the uh, on the retail. You got to get it out. You got to get in front of people. And you got to promote it. And that's the same nature as I think more than ever is that people are used to doing the pre-sale packages now. So going online, the dynamic pricing, uh, packaging as you nailed it is how can we put meal vouchers or programs and get them to pre-purchase items before they arrive to the park? What that alludes to, and we're, we're doing that now at our parks, is that once you buy your food or product before you arrive, they're more likely to spend more money when they come to the park. So it's a plus plus scenario. And that's really good. And that even can go with the retail. Uh, part of that process also is um, how you communicate your messaging. Um, you know, QR coding was mentioned earlier. Uh, when you arrive at the park, you know, don't the, – the biggest thing that I always come to parks is don't behi don't hide behind your doors. And that's really important to know because as much as you have a concession building, you know, you got to get it out in front, whether you grill outside or you got to create that experience. And that's probably the biggest thing now. What's that experience like when you come to the concession stand if it's or the restaurant? If I walk up to the same old churro and everything, they're not going to think that something's more – what is that going to feel like? And I think more and more of us are having to do that uh, to create and extend that uh, experience. It's the other, uh, I would say, the additional entertainment value of what they're getting out of your assets. And I think it's important to like specialize on a few of those 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 big wins, the things that you know that you can sell sell at a good profit margin and that has high demand. And I, I, I joke, I literally probably say the words funnel cake every two weeks. <laughs> you can get a funnel cake in a lot of places. We had John Storbeck on two weeks ago, but gosh dang it, the funnel cake at Knott's Berry Farm is completely different to me, right? Like, it's something that they do that's magic in that funnel cake, and, 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 and but just focus on that, because it's 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 not a highly perishable item. It's an item that, you know, you're not going to waste a whole lot on, um, you know, so I think it's important to think about your food offerings. Have a simple menu like but like you said, Nicole, have a simple menu, something that you could just package and sell. You're not going to sit on a ton of inventory. And then work with your vendors right now. You should be talking to your vendors right now to say, you know, I need, I need to know what you have available for me if the demand is greater than I'm expecting, right? Like, if I am going to have a, a great day, if, if, if everything aligns and I have numbers that are exceed what I normally or what I budgeted for, how can I quickly – get food um, to my guests. So um, you got to think ahead of what that looks like. And then eliminate some of the dogs on your menu. This, this item doesn't get pulled a lot. It's okay to have a reduced menu. And it's not just the attractions that are doing this. I, I, every place that I go to to get, to get meals has a limited menu right now, it seems. 
whether it's a fast food restaurant or I sit down at a regular restaurant, I'm, I'm given, I'm being given a different menu. I went to California Pizza Kitchen the other day in, in here in Tennessee. Believe it or not, we have one in Tennessee. <laughs> um, and the menu was different. And I was asking for something They're like, oh, we're not serving that item right now because they get it. They have to, they don't want to carry those food ingredients for this other menu. So make it so you can spice up something real nice or sweeten it up with some nice toppings, but stick with the core. Um, and I know, Kenny, you've done a great job of helping food consultants. I'm, uh, anything else that we didn't cover there about planning for food that you would like to add? You know, I think he nailed it. I'd just be adding a little bit more to it. I think you just got to be good at what you have. You know, the product's got to speak on its own. Um, the funnel cake is something, as an example, is when you walk around the park and people want to see that, and I, it's a showcase piece. I want that. Make sure you have your signature items um, that put you over the top. You know, uh, Randy touched on your allies who you're supporting. Look, food and beverage, as much as people think that we took a major hit for us operations, we really didn't. The reason why I say that is if you're doing following the serve safe protocols, the only thing you just added was a mask, in essence of, you know, how to cover up your, your operations because you're already majority wearing gloves. You're already, you know, washing your hands constantly. You know, you're already learning about cross contamination. So it shouldn't scare anybody getting into this, this season and think, hey, do I have to change anything? Yeah, wear a mask, you know, and I think masks will probably stay with food and beverage for a while. Um, I don't see that leaving, but overall, I think it's to your advantage. But when you, I, I think you nailed it, and I think it gives you an all, an also another opportunity of branding of your park with food and beverage. As you thin down your menu, it gives you the better opportunity to brand when people pick up their food for pre-orders. You know, you have your branding of your product in the bags and themed items. And I think you'll do really well when you leave this. And like I said, create the experience. You know, we have a park that we hand out mustaches because we're, it's an Italian place and we do pizzas. And kids love to wear the mustache. It's little things like that that put you over the top. And Kenny, you gotta brand the mustache into the mask and then it'll be perfect. <laughs> there you go. Hey, so, well, it's, you and I are copywriting that right now. But yeah, do it right. We said it right here. Mark. Tap, tap. <laughs> But, but a mask is a good example. Disney just came out. Bob Chapek said masks are going to be, you know, on everyone's face through 2021. He just yeah. flat out said it on the last investor call last week and said that's what's going to happen. And um, masks are going to be around probably for a while, and they are a fashion statement. I can't, we have so – for everyone, it's not your first rodeo. You know I've got five daughters. There are so many different masks in my house. They're all different designs. They, they match. They accessorize or whatnot. It is a great revenue opportunity. You should you should use it as a brand. John Rouse, you're joining us. I don't know if you guys have your special aquarium of the Pacific Mass, but I imagine that you do. Or you, you're you're probably putting something together. A penguin mask, maybe. Um, we don't really we we didn't get on board fast enough with that, to be honest. So we're selling a lot of masks, but nothing that's seriously branded for us. So we kind of missed the boat on that. That's okay, because Kenny and I are going to sell you the penguin mustache. That's right. That's right. And with a mustache, boy, that would be cool. <laughs> hey, uh, John, I'm glad you're joining us. I wanted to throw a question to you about technology. Um, is there anything that you're doing that's permanently different in, at, at the aquarium now? Uh, like, have you put in any permanent technology solutions, like um, different types of touchless access control or – I think thermal cameras. It's like that. Yeah, we, we did all the simple things, the contactless payments that we didn't have before. We did create stations for scanning, guests scanning their own things, but it's pretty rudimentary, but it works really good. We won't go away from that. Um, we do have thermal cameras installed, but unfortunately they're not set up for outside use. They're all for indoor use. We're still um, outdoor only right now. So um, we'll, uh, we've integrated those in with Exhibit so we can look at the reports um, from there, too. And uh, they actually have pretty good software on their side, too, to track all that. So um, that's really it. All the other – I don't think – did I miss anything, Nicole? No, you got it. No. Yeah. So the deck uh, – let's talk a little bit about the integration. That's interesting. I mean, happy – tell me what that is. I mean, is it that the thermal cameras are counting – Unique bodies as well. Is that yeah, what yeah. you mean? 
Well, they're counting they're counting our in building and our residents in certain galleries. So our Pacific Visions Gallery that we opened right a year before this COVID situation. <laughs> We were tracking attendance to that as compared to the rest of the aquarium. And so we put thermal cameras in there and also at the front entrance to track attendance and in building. Um, so we had that all in place. And then of course we had to close <laughs> the inside. <laughs> and we just got, we just integrated deck to probably, we've had it a year now, I think. And and there's the, the thermal cameras we're using are integrated into that so we can look at certain reports. Um, Gotcha. And I'm going to clarify because Matthew and I are, are making sure. These are thermal cameras that use heat imaging to detect how many unique. Well, these aren't, these aren't thermal. These are video. Oh, they're video cameras. And these are not like temperature checking. So you're not actually. These no, don't no, 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 no. We, we, we could do that. But, you know, temperature checking, as we all know, is a, a bit of a. Um, Theater. Theatrical, theatrical yes. presentation. <laughs> So, so, John, for, for those that may not be familiar with Dex, Dexabit, I, I believe that's like a business intelligence kind of tool, like, hey, I can take yeah. all of these different data things and put them together, and then I can make smarter decisions. And yeah. so what it sounds like you all have said is, hey, we're going to start leveraging this uh, data coming from these uh, these cameras to know how many folks are there to see it together with some other bit of data, and then yeah. hey, we're able to make smarter decisions about how we operate. It's a basically a big dashboard piece of software that's integrated a bunch of different data. It's it's got a lot of data sets that aren't really useful for our industry, but it has some really good options and it's pretty simple to use. Um, they've been really good to work with. So, um, but it's bringing in you know all that data, ticketing data, membership data, uh, thermal uh, not thermal video camera data, and then also a website and social media and putting it all in a big dashboard. Oh, that's awesome. I love stuff like that. Those data visualizations are great. Yeah. Just, you got to leverage that stuff. Otherwise, you know. Yeah. Nice looking grass. <laughs> um, my kids are having a great time outside. I don't know if you can hear them. So if you hear some noise, then screaming, that's a happy noise, by the way. No, oh, don't worry. <laughs> don't call somebody uh, on my behalf. Um, John, I, I last two weeks ago, John Storbeck joined us. Um, from Knotts, and when we we talked a little bit about their special events, and as we look forward to it, and we started by talking about Bunnyville, this event at Detroit Zoo, and we one of the things that John had mentioned was that they have they have events ready to go, they're, they're ready for the next thing because of the next of this uncertainty. Can you can you walk us through what the aquarium might be doing, planning for the next uncertain? <laughs> event or what what might you be able to put together really quickly you reopened your outdoor exhibits actually very quickly i think you had just a few days notice and you 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 opened pretty quick i'm just curious on a bigger scale what are what are you guys going through uh, to be ready for the next whatever well, we're, for california doesn't give us much warning on when they're going to make changes so um the change to outdoor only we we did it in two days we probably could have done it quicker but because it was a during the week, we just waited till the weekend to open. Um, but um, we're just getting ready for the indoor. We're hoping that'll happen like the outdoor. All of a sudden, the governor decides that some of the data sets are in the right, in the right position for opening. There seems to be a lot of pressure related to his recall that's pushing him along. So we're hopeful that in the next couple of weeks. So we've just been really focusing on that. We've booked, we booked probably 25 weddings so far for this year that are sort of like I don't know, you know, we have a huge disclaimer in there, but we haven't really planned any other type of events. We have people wanting to book groups that we're not too, um, we don't really have, you know, the state really hasn't produced enough data to understand how we can pull these things off. So it'll really depend on the health department requirements that they're putting in place and our capacities. Um, we've heard from our other um, Aquarium people that weddings they've had recently that are opened have been problematic for mask use and things. So we're sort of a little reticent for that. Um, so um, we're just sort of wait. We're in a wait and see sort of um, mentality for these things. 
because of the complications related to that. I don't know if we're going to need it because the pent up demand here is uh, pretty, pretty. I mean, we're selling out a week in advance for our weekend numbers. So we're hopeful that when we open up um, to the inside, we can do the same thing and, and change our hours around, which we did, which kind of limits our events. So we're open late on Saturday and Sunday now. And we'll probably do that on Friday when we get better weather and it's brighter out. So um, that's kind of our focus. We do talk about events, but without that data from the state, it sort of puts us at a disadvantage. Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, yeah, and that's some stuff. You just got to fly by the seat of your pants, so to speak. So, you know, mobilize quickly, get your staff engaged, and be ready to go. Um, that's good. That's great information. Thanks. Uh, by the way, John, so, so uh, Chris Jones wants to know uh, if you know about the what type of thermal cameras you're using. Uh, yeah, they're um, – give me one second here. They're not thermal. They're video. Video cameras. I'm sorry. <laughs> Randy, Randy loves thermal. It's sensor. 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 S-E-N-S-O-U-R-C-E, I think. Okay. Yeah. Bill D'Angelo is going to look them up and try to throw that link in the in the QA or the chat for everyone. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we're – any other – and listen, that's exactly – Chris, that's exactly the kind of questions we want. We've got great people here. We want to field those questions. So if anyone else has a question that they – well, ask, go ahead and ask it. We only have a few more minutes. So something that you said, John, I want to throw up this slide here. This is Matthew and I put together some of our kind of tips, and I don't think we're going to get through all of them. But, you know, are you ready for the demand, right? I, are you – what are you doing? There's some great articles here. We'll send you guys these links. But uh, it's about pent-up demand. It's about what we're seeing in the U.K. This is a really interesting article about youth vehicle demands out of Canada. Because so many more people are, are are used to doing some like level of mass transit, now we're not those places aren't operating, but these folks need cars. They're seeing a huge demand for cars. We, we just have to think differently about what our guests are really needing out of our experiences. So you might not have thought that these are the retail items you might need to carry, but your guests are going to want to buy those certain items. So um, do I have the resources in place to meet? And I wrote unprecedented demand, and I cross it out. It shouldn't be unprecedented. Plan ahead. Talk to John. Talk to Kenny. Talk to folks. Talk to Nicole. Find out, like, what the demand is really going to be. Um, think about your call center. A lot of us had to let go of staff out of our call center, and it's a bummer that we had to do it. But I guarantee you, when you go live with your ticketing or your next program or your next event, um, we're seeing jumps from 20% online sales to 95, 99% online. When you have 5, 10, 20 more times of the traffic going online, you should expect that those people are going to need more help. You've got to have a call center ready. And if you don't have the ability to have a call center, talk to your neighboring attractions. See if you, those, those, some of those folks might be able to help you. You might be able to utilize some of those staff members. Who knows, you guys might be able to share a little bit. Can I jump in, Andy? Yeah. Yeah, I think one thing we're pushing more is chat, because chat, chat, yep. chat can be done in, from anywhere. So we're um, trying to reduce our phone uses through chat. So we can redeploy some of our ticket sellers and our management teams to do chat a couple hours a day, because it gives them some some um, experience, too, of what people are asking. So we've been sort of deploying. It's like Nicole, Nicole and I do them every once in a while, too, just to see what's happening. Um, out there, because most of the questions are simple, to be honest. And and we're we're using Happy Fox now, um, which seems to be a, we had Oracle for a while, which was more, a more expensive solution. But this Happy Fox is fairly reasonable and it works really good. That's great. Hey, uh, one of the things that I wanted to take an opportunity to share, and as I think about spring break, is ensuring that we use this as a time to um, reinforce training. So, uh, obviously, we've we've changed radically in 12 months what folks need to be doing in their job. We've added a lot of different responsibilities and mass checking and things like that. And I I think this is a, a great opportunity just to make sure that we're we're still adhering to those that we haven't fallen back into, oh, well, you know, what was comfortable or, or what has become comfortable. 
um, and, and that we're still kind of creating that environment that we we wanted to create um, so that that as guests are returning to us and in higher volumes that they're really having that that great experience and I, and I think that's actually probably one of the things that's that's very common if even if we weren't in a pandemic right let's let's make sure that that uh, um, when we're our busiest that we're providing that same level of service as when we are are, are low. Uh, Nicole or, or Ken, are there any things from a training standpoint that, that are like key items that you focus on as you get ready for, for spring break? And Nicole, maybe I'll start with you. Um, I mean, it's really just reinforcing um, and not getting complacent with the current procedures, right? I think we've all been wearing masks and we've been talking about hand sanitizing and washing your hands and distancing. Those are some of the things that still present real challenges. So those are the things that we have to reinforce almost daily uh, with with people. Um, so it has become part of a, a routine for our management to be on the lookout. Uh, you know, we're looking for things that we never had to look for before. <laughs> um, but that's where we find ourselves a lot of the time. So, um, you know, spring break is just about, um, you know, staying the course and, and, and uh, keep, keeping things positive and keeping folks energized, you know, with procedures that they've been doing for months now um, and trying to keep that new and relevant. So that's really where, where we're focusing at this point. We've seen uh, just the kind of springboard offer is people have moved their trainings to online. So it's watching that orientation video online from their home so that they can access that instead of having hundreds of people at one point. Now you can also track people when they do the orientation. Uh, did they attend? Did they be a part of it? And then putting tests apart. it. Some people, we've learned from the teachers even a little bit, you know, using programs such, such as Cahoots to do tests and make sure they gain the knowledge. So there's, there's a lot of assets out there, like I said, um, that help you get through the process. And then when they finally show up, um, you know, they're ready for their department or their specific division training. And some of that's even going online. They're getting ahead to saving time when they actually arrive to the park. Kenny, that, that's a great point to end on. I mean, right now, uh, especially if you're a, uh, if you hire high school age or young adults, they're being trained on using these tools right now through the, the, the school at home programs, right? The hybrid learning or whatever it is. And so, yeah, being able to use those tools effectively, it's really going to make us more efficient as we move forward. But that's a really great closing remark there. Once we get to hire and operate and, and get going. So, everybody, that, that's our time. We've shortened these to an hour, but this was an amazing conversation. Uh, John and Kenny and, and Nicole, great, great job. Great questions, everybody. Um, on behalf of Gateway, thanks for joining us. Uh, Kenny, you can be reached at amusementprofessionals.com. Uh, John and Nicole, your emails we shared with the whole world. So I know that we could uh, email you guys as well should you have any questions. So I thank you guys all very, very much for joining us today. Um, as we move forward, uh, we do, don't forget that special webinar that's coming up. We've got some great chats upcoming here in the next uh, month through the end of March. So please register and sign up for those. You can scan this QR code to download our latest white paper where we talk about a lot of cool things like that we talked about today. Um, you can email us at, at these links here. And I meant to put this one up first. And you can sign up for our next webinar uh, by scanning that QR code as we learn from industry leaders. So everyone, thank you very much for joining us. We'll see you uh, in a couple of weeks. And we wish you all uh, a safe day. And um, Thank you for joining us. Bye, everybody. Have a wonderful day.